Hey everyone, and welcome to the video verse. Uh, I am joined today by my esteemed colleague Zoe Zoe Lou. Sorry, mispronouncing your name already, uh, and David Lee. And we're joined here with uh, CP. I'm really excited to have you here on the show, CP. Can you just quickly introduce yourself? Tell us uh, who you are and what you are currently doing at MOLA. Yeah, sure, Nathan. Uh, it's actually a pleasure to be here on the on the program. So as I mentioned, my name is CP. I'm actually with the CTO of MOLA, one of the homebrew OTT platform provider coming up from domestic Jakarta, Indonesia. Right. Uh, over the past year, we have actually successfully beach hit into the rest of the Asia, like Singapore, Malaysia. At the same time, we are establishing our presence uh, in UK as well as Italy. Wow! So you guys are all spreading out through Europe as well, then. Yes. Mm. Awesome. That's really cool. So, before Mola, you came from HBO, and I want to talk That's about correct. that. But before that, let's go back even further. And can you tell us? how you got started in the world of video codec and encoding, kind of what was your first uh, encounter with codec? How did you get into it? Oh, that's a long, long time ago. So my first, <laughs> uh, I, I was really, really dropped in. I said, they pushed me into the swimming pool, right? When I was nice. actually asked to spearhead uh, for South Asia, the so-called professional post-production world. Because Apple at the time okay. was introducing Final Cut Pro uh, into the oh. market. Yes, and we do not yes. have any expertise on the ground. Um, I actually came from an engineering background. No video, okay. uh, no post-production. So was I, that's why I, mean, <laughs> I really was pushed into the swimming pool and forced to swim yeah, no without any lifeboat. Uh, so like, actually, that is the time where I started looking at first, uh, video per se. And Kodak actually comes up as a form. Uh, supplementary from the angle because as an engineer at heart, you don't just do the application and click here, click there. You really want to know what's happening. So I spent yes. time to really understand the different posts uh, codec that is so and what makes uh, the world works from production to distribution as well. Okay. So what, what codecs would that have been in those early days? for Final Cut? Was it ProRes at the time or? Yes, that so we ProRes? actually started, we actually started with ProRes as the base for the post at this site. Okay. Of course, yeah. So we have the ProRes HD, we have the ProRes HQ, and then later on yeah. we have the XQ and so forth, yeah. Of course. So you got thrown in from the production side, but then distribution was a natural progression from there, I guess. If you edit your video, now I want to distribute it? Correct. So from the production angle, we, we then have two kinds of distribution. We have actually what we call the original media distribution, where we actually allow the video to be sent in high quality to other okay. partners uh, for ed further edit. And then we have the uh, really streaming, or not really streaming, in the distribution media mechanism, like MPEG force, MPEG tools yeah. that is meant yeah. for uh, really simple, lightweight uh, delivery. Okay. And so this is all, I don't want to say uncompressed because it's all been compressed from ProRes, but uncompressed yeah. compared to like H.264 delivery over the web. Is that right? Definitely, yes. Okay. Wow, that's really interesting. It's, it's another world of codec and encoding is all of that production side yeah. of things, which is a world I live in. I, I edit in Final Cut and I mm. use ProRes all the time, but then I have to deliver and have to choose my, my delivery format. Um, Talking about uh, moving from HBO, your experience there, uh, over to MOLA, was there a big difference technology-wise? Um, was there a different market, or was the market different, I should say? Uh, now, now we're talking about the delivery of it from HBO versus a Southeast Asia-focused um, audience. Was there a big difference between the two that you had to address? I think um, in, in a certain way that is, but in, in general, uh, the directions or rather the, the the final destination is almost the same, right? In HBO, okay. coming from the cable world, uh, one of my key tasks was actually to look at the di digital distribution as well. Yeah, and that includes okay. HBO Go streaming platform for Asia. So from that angle, yeah. the, the focus into the OTT world has become uh, predominantly strong as well as focus uh, for the organization. Yeah. 
uh, in Mona, of course, uh, starting from a digital native world, from the OTT platform initiative. Uh, right now, we are also looking, moving back into the linear cable world. So to me, it's a very interesting mix because it is like yeah. on, um, driving on the left-hand side or driving on the right-hand side and trying to balance <laughs> both, right? I, I came from the left-hand drive environment, moving towards the right-hand right. drive. Now I'm in the right-hand drive environment, trying to rebuild the left-hand <laughs> drive for this organization. <laughs> Wow. So, it's a very interesting analogy about these experiments. That's a great yeah. analogy, yeah. yeah. So you started out with the, those production formats, moved towards mm -hmm. the distribution for OTT, and now they're asking you for the cable, everything's going digital as well. Is that right? Is that what's driving is, you? Yes. Correct. I, I okay. think the key difference will be in this case uh, for the new world, even going back into the linear space, it is really digital driven as compared to before, but it's really a little bit more RF and satellite. Okay. And if mm. that's all digital, what, what codecs are they using? Oh, actually, in terms of the codec, it is still something that is, I, I would say that, that there are many ways to do it. Uh, for distribution, in terms of streaming, we are mm -hmm. literally can be also using things like WhiteVime and HLS. There's one format that we use is also Zixi that allow us to actually uh, deliver our final uh, production as in final stream to affiliates and there's also things like l2tp yeah uh, okay. that's actually developed by some other organizations that gives us efficiency as well i think for this angle um it is still evolving because predominantly in the past for this huge base distribution it has always been using the satellite for its actually multicast mechanism but as we switch to ip that is always that is this i would say bottleneck in the ip world when it needs to come to a wide distribution point that the satellite can achieve much more efficiently. And, but I think the technology is picking up with more vendors coming into the space, learning the efficiency of how the satellite are using and then moving that into, into the IP world while maintaining the, I would say the SLA, as well as the yeah. response cycle for the distribution itself. Very interesting. Mm. So, at MOLA then, I know that you you actually did a lot of engineering work yourself on the platform, your CTO, but you, you've been hands-on with the technology, is that right? Uh, it depends how you define hands-on. Uh, if you're Fair saying enough. that I go into coding, nah, I, I, don't, I no. can't do that anymore. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I can code to save my skin if I need to. But fortunately, <laughs> I, I don't need to save it, right? So, but what I do right. is that uh, my position actually as CTO in MOLA is really to look at the various tech stack. And for okay. me, tech stack, it is not a singular big monolithic design. It has to be uh, modular. It has to be flexible. So from a technology standpoint, even back from the HBO days when we started to do HBO Go, we are always looking at specific component and how to okay. maximize that particular module, for example. At the same time, integrate it with the rest of the modules for the whole tech stack to work. I think that is always the piece that is the most challenging, but it's, mm -hmm. it's also the most satis satisfying when you get to the end of the road. I, I would say that almost every, everywhere is challenging, right? Because uh, if you look from a platform perspective, uh, right from subscription, right from video delivery, even things like the CMS, of the control plane, uh, the player, uh, the DRM, and so forth. Every one of them has its own set of challenge. And yeah. the, the variable is so huge because there are so many ways you know, to, to do that one single part. And it also impacts on the upstream as well as the downstream of things. So the challenge of a technology team is also always looking at all these uh, pieces and ensuring that the handover from one module to the other is done at its best ability. At the same time, not causing any uh, de full dependency. The whole reason we go modular is so that we can actually change parts easily if there's a newer and more efficient way to do things. So if you design with different modules so tightly coupled, then we have a problem when times comes to change because right. when you change one module, you have to affect so other mo many modules for a tech team, it becomes very stressful. And, and we know when you are stressed, you don't produce good work. I think that's always the key. You're right. 
So basically, I think you'd really look for、uh, kind of independent modules that could be potentially easy to be relatively easy to be replaced. But on the I wouldn't, other I wouldn't side, say the word. I wouldn't say the word "replace" because it is not a very good word to use. I would yeah, say yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I would say in terms,、uh, I always look at technology that is is or the parts is easy for us to evolve our tech stack. Because I think very importantly from a technology standpoint is that we always want to deliver better and better over time.、Mm-hmm. So whatever we look at, we must have the opportunity for that component to be optimized, okay, to be enhanced、uh, over time. Yeah, to be upgraded,、mm. for example,、yes. right?、Mm. Yeah. So then, it's just、uh, because I think there's several goals you try to get, right? Because you want them to be upgraded, so relatively you want each module to be relatively independent of each other. But you also look for the overall performance optimization so that they can work each other seamlessly as seamlessly as possible. And、yes. on the other side. Uh, you also previously when we met, you most mentioned you want also the whole system to be able to scalable. So there's several things coming together. They got to be conflict against each other. So how you handle、uh, that kind of things? Yeah,、uh, that's the fun part of tech, right? If there's no conflict, we don't have things to do. I always <laughs> say it's, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. The technology side of things is always relooking over and over again, and the job is never done. Today we can actually launch a new platform, running,、uh, fine,、uh, scalable. But tomorrow we always find that hey, there's small little part that we think we might have overlooked it, and then we re-optimize again. And as when you look at all、mm. these optimization point, you'll find more and more. It is just like a string, a thread, no, from a, a, a shirt. The more you pull, the more you get actually、uh, get from it as well. <laughs> I think that's that's the. That's to me is always the most fun part of things, is always really looking. That's why I、uh, one thing about the tech group that I run is that I always tell people, our work is never done. If we think that the work is done, that means we are not doing things correctly.、Uh-huh. Our work is milestone driven. We have completed one milestone, but it always important for us to really look at what we have we are doing, to find out how we can even do it better. So I was gonna say I love your optimistic outlook. <laughs> that if there, if there isn't challenges, we don't have any work to do. I love that.、Yeah. That's a T-shirt right there. <laughs> yeah, I just Zoe, wonder. Yeah, I think、question? you can give us some example, like once, for example, some modules you really want to optimize it, but then sometimes you may have to like this module to at least work with another module. Sometimes you have to compromise something, right? Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's true. It's for example, if you look at just from the OTT perspective. Uh, from the subscription to the playback to rather to the encryption or DRM, all these modules are literally、uh, independent in a specific way. Yeah,、uh, even the encoding and the transcoding. But if you look at the whole flow of chain, even from the upstream before he hits the platform to the media supply chain, there are always the intricacy of the connectivity, okay, and its dependency. Like Kodak, for example, coming from a Kodak、uh, as heavy as big as ProRes, it doesn't make sense for that to get into our OTT platform directly and then do the encoding into the streaming format. So what we did was to introduce a distribution、uh, master format that allow us to actually has a s- smaller, lighter, and more efficient way to distribute this into the platform. While、well, we host our original masters in the archive for any further edits for any promo works that needs to be done, right? And that's that's how the whole handshake between the different modules needs to be looked at. Not just with the module itself, but with the whole encompassing、uh, components that is supporting it, right? And this allow us to then streamline certain flows, right? Uh, on the other end, look at just a player. For example, there are so many native players on the market. There are also commercial players. So the decisions whether to use a single commercial player, okay, or to use multiple native player is another tricky as well as challenging、mm-hmm. uh, things to look at. It also depends on how the organization to wants to go forward.、Uh, so what Mola has been doing previously was to really branch out into native player. Uh, because of its ease of control in individual component, right? But、yeah. right now、um, we are 
doing refundamentals in the new platform. And for the, us to work more efficiently, I think the key will be efficiency. If we were to move with pure native player, we will find that every single team will need to have its own set of issues and resolutions. Yeah. So we yeah. decided to adopt a singular commercial player that we can work with so that we come back to a baseline. But if you look at the, having a baseline concept, it's not necessarily the best as well because what it means is that you cannot fully utilize every single platform's uniqueness. Be it on right. iOS, Android, and mm, Tizen, yeah. all these yeah. players will then become a baseline that you will spread across and you cannot really you know, enhance the user experience based on the platform that you're running. So this is always the, I would say the chicken and eggs uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. And the dilemma between any technology decision that we made, it, it really depends on what is the end game. So for us, the end game is about user experience and stability. Mm -hmm. So coming to a fundamental allow us to build the stability and a consistent user experience to every one of our users. Yeah, I think that's, that is one of the key challenges for any OTT platform provider like us. Uh, number one, from the regional perspective, different countries have different capabilities as well as segment of users in terms of their endpoints experience, right? Just from the handset perspective, uh, countries like Singapore, Malaysia, which are more developed, you'll find that they tend to have the bigger players. We have the handsets that's more powerful, that can deliver more experience. But uh, countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, they come from an angle where you have slightly, for short of a better word, cheaper handsets that is not as mm -hmm. powerful, right? I think this presents a very strong challenge to any player like us because how can we keep the experience consistent to the users? And to be extremely frank, there is no way you can have a full consistent experience. It's about mm -hmm. finding the best fit for that user in the country. Right. For example, in a high uh, bandwidth environment like Singapore, the experience will really be towards super high quality audio, video experience as well as interaction to the users. But in a very mobile-driven country like Indonesia, then it might be actually towards efficiency of delivering the stream so that they get to see what they are supposed to be seeing. A very interesting example that I always put is that uh, because football used to be, or soccer used to be one of the key component within the Mola uh, platform. Um, if you look at any matches, a lot of people always just look at the players okay, and maybe the, the ball itself, whether it gets into the net, right? But if you look at how codex are being uh, engineered, and how it actually has been evolved. Look at the glass field, right? In, in the in original days, with the quarter signs, VGA component, literally you don't see any patches, or rather you really see patches instead of the leaves or the grass. But today with good quality codec, you can really see the glass field nicely, including the lines painted on the glass itself. Mm -hmm. I think those are the elements that, uh, from a provider perspective, to me, it is important we can get to that state on the devices. But again, due to the limitation of the bandwidth in the in-country, as well as the handset, we might need to moderate that. So some users will get the super crisp clear you know, quality of video. Some users will get a slightly uh, not as clear but you see, most important for, for football is you can see the ball. That's the most important as well as the jersey number. So you know which player is actually kicking the ball. Um, but it's also about the latency as well as the streaming quality. So you don't have a player suddenly appearing from the left of the field and it jumps to the right. You really can see the player running across. right? So the challenge in terms of delivery is always that how to maintain that kind of uh, smoothness versus the kind of clarity. That is always mm -hmm. a balance point that we need to compromise depending on the environment, depending on the handset of the users as well. CP, can you share mm. with us some of the latest technologies that you guys are exploring that are gonna help you do this dance between clarity and smoothness and any of the other variables <clears throat> that you guys are using? 
Mm, sure. Uh, I think from our from technology angle, we are doing a quite a lot of things. Um, when we first started in the organization, the first thing was we, to for us was to relook really at the whole delivery environment or the delivery network, right? Right. Um, there is no equal provider of the CDNs in the world. We have the big yeah. players, we have the boutique players, and we have um, homebrew players. I think everybody has a part to play in this world depending on how okay. we want to actually get this to the end user. And this is where, uh, from the technology team in MOLA, we are very focused on making sure that we have all the ways to deliver the stream to the end users at the best mm -hmm. rate, as well as the least latency. So we work with all, almost every one of the CDM providers that we know of uh, to ensure that we have okay. that road you know, yeah. uh, to the users. Then the challenge comes is, how do we determine which road to take? Right, it's just yeah. like if we are, I mean, like David, Zoe, uh, we are world travelers. For us to travel from Singapore to San Francisco, I have 101 airlines to take. So which one is the <laughs> most efficient for me, right? The same thing for right. CDN, we do have to have all those things as well. And this is even before looking at the business metrics. We're just talking about technology metrics. Yeah. And that's why things like selector, things like uh, logic, as well as uh, design comes into play to ensure that we have that road taken care of. Then of, the next one is the video itself. How is it so the different rendition? Okay, because for different countries, as I mentioned, different countries, different handset, there are different kind of capability. So the renditions of the profiles that we actually send to the devices also plays an important part. Of course, a, a very basic profile is you just have that. Uh, six different rendition and they're offered to every devices, right? It is a very base way to do things. It works, yeah. but it just do yeah. not give you the best experience on the handset that your users might have. So that's from us to also move forward is how to discover as well as how to determine what of rendition to be sent to what devices. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the things that uh, Mola has been working on to make sure that ultimately when the users get into our platform from whichever endpoint, be it a mobile, be it a set of box, be it on the web, our systems will try to deliver the stream to them mm -hmm. using the kind of uh, technology that their endpoints can best tap on. And then we look at the delivery um, road to them mm -hmm. so that we actually yeah. has the delivery end to end uh, being taken care of. So is that, obviously, first you're gathering data on all the different devices and the path so that you know which airlines are available, right? Yeah. Um, is that AI running in the background, making all of these decisions, I guess millions of decisions, I would imagine, or how hmm. is that, is that third-party services? Is it your own AI? Okay. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the part that, for me personally, I have never liked to use the word AI because it is been overused, right? Yeah, you're um, right. It means a lot of yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Correct. So if you look you're at right. the base of AI as artificial intelligence, it means that it just it makes logic decision based on data. Yes. That's to me is okay. it's AI. No matter how people are beautifying it, making it sexy, you know, kind of things. But to me, oh, yeah. AI, the base is that it's really given the correct data, what it needs to do, right? Okay. Um, in that case, yes, that is what we are doing. We are collecting every single data that we can from our endpoints wow. so that we know the road to the endpoint. And then right. based on that, we set up different logics so that we can then determine what to do for the particular endpoint for the, based on the country, based on the user's network. Yeah. And that over time gives us a better delivery to the end user. So how do you collect those data from the, for example, from the receiver or end side, from the player side? How, mm. uh, so what kind of so tools? We, so today, when, okay, when I joined um, Mola on board, I, that was one of the key challenges that I had because I don't have visibility on actually what is out on the market from our end user handset. And, and that's a big challenge. And without those information, yeah. that's really literally, you are really firing the dark, right? Um, so the first thing that I, I actually went to do was to uh, work with, uh, okay, should I mention company names here? This is, this is the question. You're comfortable. It's okay, right? Ah, 
Yeah, for me, it's uncomfortable. Just I need to know because I, I, I've been doing a lot of all these things. I just need to be curious. Certain things, they don't like us to mention uh, organization in that sense. Otherwise, yeah, certain organization me. is that once you mention that name, they will go and find that, com- uh, that company and say, hey, can you sponsor? So I need to be back. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So, let me tell um, Yeah, so when I started joining Mola, one of the key challenges is actually about making sure that we know how is our users experiencing our stream. And that part it is critical to me from any technology angle as well as in the future, yeah. any marketing recommendations, all those data are critical. So the first thing that I actually went to do was I went back to a, a well-known dependable partner called Conviva that mm. I have been very familiar with. So with yep. the assistance of Conviva, we built up a path that I can then collect all the endpoint information from the stream perspective, right? And with this information, it helps me to make the correct decision of how my CDN needs to be retweet, how my players needs to be uh, rebuilt, how is the codex or the streams that I'm looking at, how efficient it is to reach my end users in the different part of the world, right? So it forms two things. One, as we move along, this technical data helps me to do real-time decision-making using the system. As we start to see CDN's uh, performance dropping, we can immediately switch okay, the delivery path to a much more non-congested CDN, for example. At the same time, this data on collection allows the team to look at where is the bottleneck that we need to fix from a technology angle so that we can actually eliminate that right from source as well. So data like this are really critical to our operational as well as our roadmap planning. I think um, after we have implemented Conviva, the, the key thing that it actually help us uh, to re-emphasize as well as to reiterate the concept of the, the differences between the different countries, right? For example, if you look at Indonesia per se, um, majority of the streams are really mobile, which means that we're looking at anything uh, maxing out maybe about one Mac. Okay? Whereas from these uh, high quality streams that goes onto broadband, um, the number is significantly lower. Of, of course, that again depends on the time of the day, but I'm talking in general over 24 hours. right? The mobile space in the Indonesian market is so much uh, bigger as in compared to the broadband side of things where you have the Android TVs and so forth. But over the year, we also see that changing. I think as a, as a country mature, as a market mature, these statistics will start to change. Uh, as compa- so if you compare to, let's say, Singapore, you find that majority actually are on the last screen setup where we then deliver higher big rate streams, okay, as huge as 5 to 10 meg where it's needed so that you actually fulfill the 60-inch uh, TV running on the smart uh, OS. So this is the kinds that also then help us to, or rather reminded us that not everyone is equal. If I deliver a stream that is suitable for uh, handset, you'll find that that stream does not do justice to the Android TV version running on the 65-inch TV set. But if I were trying to fully push the quality to the 65-inch TV set, I will face problem with the person running on a typical Android mobile on a uh, 4G network. Right? But I think over time, with technology, like now with 5G coming in place, all these things start to change again. You'll find that we can then deliver much more uh, high-quality stream to the same user, even with the same handset. I think there's always these three parts. One, the handset itself, which is what the users are holding. Okay? And second is what we are actually delivering and capable to deliver of. But the most important is actually the road between these two, right? the network itself. And these are the times that in different environments, different countries, there are different stage of maturity. But everybody is due to catch up or leap from each other, depending on which state they are in today. So when we do from a technology stack standpoint, the easy way is always do what is needed to satisfy today, right? The hard part is do what is required 
to make what is needed today at the same time build enough flexibility for your systems to evolve. Yeah, yes. and that's why for me it's important doing the second part and doing it correctly, doing it well, because that gives you much more stability as well as the longevity in the in the business. So, CP, as we wrap things up here, kind of mm. moving, looking forward, we've talked a lot about you're always very thoughtfully developing and designing a tech stack. We'll use that as kind of the broad term hmm. to, like you just said, do what you do what's needed, but also do what's required. But also thinking about the future for, let's say either for MOLA or for OTT delivery in general, what does the future hold? Do you think what's next that you guys are looking at down the road when it comes to video delivery? Is it the codec? Is it the path? Is it all of the above? What's your thought? What are you looking forward to in the future? I think from a te technology standpoint, it's all of the above. Um, but yes. as any business goes uh, from OTT delivery standpoint, uh, I always say that it is the end user experience that is the most important element. Because there's always two, things, two ways to look at it. One is you look from the uh, base, right? You, it's like you're building a Lego set. You use, you get the base, you get the blocks, you start building it, uh, and you start piecing them together. The other one is having a vision as well as a picture in place first. Whether you want to build mm -hmm. a castle, a house, a horse, a car, you need to know what you want to do, and then you look for the pieces to start building towards that. Okay. Right. Uh, a lot of technologies always falls into the trap of the first. Why? Because we are always being pushed. I need this soft, I need this clear. Right. But I think a real technologist needs to look at, as I keep on mentioning, two things. One, we definitely need to solve today's problem because if we do not solve today's problem, there's no tomorrow. But right. we need <laughs> right. to look at the day after tomorrow, not tomorrow. We need to look mm -hmm. at the day after tomorrow. So like what you mentioned there, from an ODD perspective, it is what would the end user wants, right? What would excite them coming on board to the platform, right? Today, if you look at the market, uh, with all the players uh, coming back into the global world, every OTT platforms come with a very similar base. If you think about it, the base is just deliver the video to the user so they can watch it and get them right. on your platform continuously. Right? That right. is why the, the word is called content is king because content is the one that is driving. But mm -hmm. content can drive to a certain extent. Having the user engagement back into the platform, I think, is as critical. And that is where I think mm -hmm. going forward, it is where the fight really begins. If we can find ways okay, to have the users much more engaged with the content itself, that gives you the edge against the other uh, platform per se. Yeah, so then I have a follow-up question really want mm. to ask you. So how to get in your opinion, uh, the final users would, uh, to get fully engaged. Do you think, for example, somebody thinks you have to get a better quality? Quality means that the, uh, the video should be more fluid and even with high resolution, talking about HDR, 4K, or um, basically we may have to have um, some certain kind of format to really get the customer or the end users mm. engaged. Mm. For example, if we do some uh, extremely low latency, right? Then the basic the end user can really get some interaction with the distributor. And then this way they can also got more engaged. So what do you see? Which fact I know it's, this could be many factors. So if you like you you like make a uh, like uh, justification. So which factor, what top one, top two, top three factors mm. will mostly in, influence the end user's engagement? Yeah, I, I think what you uh, and the, the things that you have just listed has become a fundamental. It is no longer uh, good to have. Right? When we yeah. first started in the OTT world, trying to get the lower latency, trying to get the higher video bit rate so that you get a better quality of video to the end users, getting HDR, Adobe, etc. Those becomes, those are like add-ons, but to me, those are actually fundamentals that it should have. It's just like uh, a, a differences between a Toyota, a Lexus, a BMW. They're all cars, right? Four wheels, yeah. engine, and so forth. The, the, the 
fact that the wheels are fundamental, engine is fundamental, right? The navigation system is fundamental. Then mm -hmm. what I feel is what is actually differentiating between them, right? From the mm -hmm. platform, that's why I say about user engagement. How can users be more engaged with the platform? I think some organizations are already doing today, like making group watch, uh, content recommendations, all this. They are, some are passive, some are active. But this mm -hmm. is the evolution, I think, from the platform perspective, so that users becomes a part of the family. And to me, it is not just online. The integration between the online and the offline world will start to happen as well, right? Short mm -hmm. of being, uh, I, I would say, as in a, a trend-following uh, word, the multiverse, I, I'm still trying to get in touch with what exactly is a multiverse today because different people... Yeah. Oh, sorry, not multiverse, it's metaverse. Multiverse is marvelous. Metaverse. <laughs> yeah, so talking <laughs> about metaverse, right? I'm still trying to get in touch. Is A lot of definitions of metaverse is actually out there. So I think those are the environment where any organization, even people like us, start to need to understand how do all these new world okay, can then be integrated and merge with what we have mm -hmm. today. Uh, even back to a very basic mm -hmm. environment where, uh, remember back in, well, this, in the past, it's not really a past, maybe a few years ago, we are talking about the death of cable, where the lean back yeah. experience of watching cable, this is dying, right? And the lean forward experience of Netflix, uh, HBO, etc. Yes. is the new world. But if you look at yeah. what is happening today, it is changing again. There is actually a tight coupling between the lean back experience and the lean forward experience into yeah. one, right? So this is what I mean by evolution as well as uh, things that we need to actually keep on looking at, right? One of the key between what we're also doing is to really merge lean back, lean forward experience to the end user so that we can satisfy from an end user perspective, what is the best way for them to enjoy the platform? I, I think that's the key is to enjoy the platform. There's a lot of ways to look at it. There is no one size fit all at this moment. And the challenge for the technology team is to really identify which tech which experience tool can help us to do that so that our users mm -hmm. will feel that this is not just a viewport, but it is a part of their lifestyle that they will be looking at. Hmm. Yeah, we hear social media platforms maybe talk about more in the past, but you're exactly right. Content is winning out, but it's the engagement and it's the different types of engagement around the content. Hmm. Um, so that's, that's fascinating, very interesting. Um, CP, thank you so much for letting us pick your brain and for uh, a lot of wisdom uh, that came out today that you shared with us. Uh, the, I, I find it fascinating how you tied the technology, the end user and everything in between all together. Every decision impacts the other one. So thank you again for sharing that. Thank you for being a guest on our podcast. And uh, I hope we get to do this again and, uh, and hear more about you and, and Mola and what you guys are doing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for getting me on here as well.